expression my mother often used is that you do the right things for the right reasons and you live with the consequences. You got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? Hey everybody, it's Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, really exciting day for me because uh, I admire the gentleman that I will be interviewing quite a bit and have for a very long time. And we're, uh, we, we spent two seconds getting to know each other talking, of course, football, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but as many of you know who follow my content, I haven't done a whole lot of interviews lately. And to be frank, I, I think that uh, interacting with all of you and answering your questions has been really fruitful. And I wanna save the interviews on the podcast for special occasions, one that excites me or one that I think can disproportionately bring value to the audience. And this showman hits on both fronts. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Arthur Blank to the show. Uh, I will let this uh, prestigious gentleman introduce himself because I'm curious to hear how he positions himself these days. And he's got a new book out and I know how how much my audience has enjoyed getting to know authors uh, around books and have been big supporters. So I hope uh, the Vayner Nation can climb some Amazon and Barnes and Noble's ratings and uh, things of that nature. So uh, excited for the new book, Good Company. So Arthur, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm fine. It's an honor to, uh, to uh, chat with you for a little bit. Um, the, other, the other thing which we share, and we share, probably share a lot of things in common, but we, we both came from Queens. That's right. And uh, so I have that, um, you know, that diversity and that life experience in my, uh, in my background. But uh, Today, I, uh, you know, I co-founded the Home Depot in 1979 with our first stores and left in 2001. And we were the second largest retail in the world at that time. And today, it's the company has a, a book value or capital value, I should say, of close to $300, million, $300 billion. And I transitioned into a variety of other things um, to the Atlanta Falcons, which you mentioned, Atlanta United, our major league soccer team. We operate the PGA Tour Superstores, which is the largest golf retail in America today. Uh, we operate uh, several guest ranches in Montana, rated number one um, in, in the western part of the country. And we have a very active and um, a philanthropic uh, family foundation. So we're involved in a lot of things. And I think the beauty of the book and the essence of the book is that all the values that we cultivated and developed at Home Depot for 23 years and now being shepherded along beautifully by Craig Manier and their whole team um, are the same values we put in place in all of these different industries, in different settings, different geographies with fans, customers, and guests, all three of them, through our associates and connected to the communities that we live in. And really the emphasis of the stories and the thoughts throughout the book is that you can have both profitability and emphasis on the people side of the equation. In fact, if you're going to have um, going to really going to achieve both at high levels, you need to uh, you need to achieve both. You need to put emphasis on both of them, and one feeds the other very strongly. So uh, it, it's a great book, not because I wrote it. It's not really about me, but it's about the values which we think are transportable to virtually every business, for profit or nonprofit, as the case may be. Arthur, I think this is where you know we share a lot of perspective. I, you know, to me, I call my Vayner X, my universe, I call it the honey empire. You know, I have enormous ambitions. You know, I, I'd like to match the accomplishments you have, especially because I want to buy the New York Jets. And, <laughs> and, 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 but I also think that you can do that with honey over vinegar. I, I'm uncomfortable actually yeah. in deep negativity and, and bad human traits. And, you know, I, I I, I enjoy the part of my career right now because I have a lot of kids watching me on these social networks and words, you know, I started a wine brand, it's called Empathy. You know, like these things to me, and you were pioneering it before, I think people are confused that you don't have to kill people or be mean to be a successful business person. I think that's what I heard in your opening statement. Yeah, well, I, I think not, not, not only uh, you don't have to be that way, I think it's it's counter being successful. I agree. And I'm measuring success really in, uh, in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is the financial results, which obviously is what most people conventionally would think of, but also in terms of um, having purpose in life. And uh, you don't have to be uh, someone like a Deepak Chopra, who's a good friend and endorsed the book and read it. But... Um, but you, you, you have to understand that, you know, young people today, today particularly, I think, are striving for 
more purpose than I think they've ever, ever done so in the past. An example, and you're probably familiar with this, is Dr. Laurie Santos, uh, who also read the book and endorses it, who has a professor of psychology at Yale University. She started this course, as you probably know, on, 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 on happiness, happiness lab, because 30, 40 kids said to her, there has to be more in life than just this. There has to be more in life than just making money, et cetera, and being successful. She now, uh, as many of your listeners may be aware, she now um, she teaches that class to a quarter of the student body of Yale University at a time, one quarter. It's the largest enrollment class I've ever had in the history of Yale, oh my gosh. 205 years old, and it's now available to everybody online. So pass that on to your listeners too. It's available online and it's done beautifully. So, Arthur, let me ask you a question. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I want to get so much out of you in this short time together. Yeah. What kind of kid were you? Like I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very curious. Yeah. Well, I was you very know, competitive. I was very okay. competitive. I, I, you know, and my focus really growing up was sports. I played football, ran track, played baseball. You know, for my high school, and uh, and I was really good athlete. I would say um, not good enough to go to the next level. And I pretty much banged myself up in my junior year playing football. We had a great football team at Stuyvesant High School in New York. Our, my junior year, we won. All of our games, average score was like 44 to 6, I think, something like that. <laughs> so we uh, we had a really good team. We had a bunch of uh, young men that went on and got full scholarships and played well and collegiately. But um, were so you, I've always, were, I've always were been competitive. Were your, you know, so I don't know if you know this because I, I know you knew, it sounds like you knew the Queens part, but I was actually born in Belarus in the former Soviet Union. No, and I, didn't I know that, yeah. yeah, and I came over in 78. When they really? let when they let a small amount of Jews out, when Israel yeah. and America, you might remember this jury was I able do. to get, you know, so yeah. that that is, you know, my origin story. And I've always felt, and I tell a lot of my contemporaries in their late 30s, early 40s that are business men and women that are similar to me. When we get into these dinners, I'm like, you have to understand, I'm far more like your grandfather than I am like you, because <laughs> I lived in a studio apartment with, you know, seven family members. Like I remember that. This is not my, you know, right. so I, I think that you you grew up in a Queens in your in your years. A, was it your parents or your grandparents that came over from the old country? It was my grandparents. Right, uh, so so to me, I'm, I'm curious, how much do you think the environment that you grew up in lent itself to the acceleration of your competitiveness? Because it's obviously a DNA yeah. game, but it's also clearly an environment game. Yeah. And looking at your timing of when you're growing up in Queens, I'm always romantic about that era as a historian because I yeah. think a lot of good chips on shoulders and ruggedness that led to great success, to your point, both happy and yeah. altruistic and, yeah. you know, kind of financial. There's a yeah. lot of men and women that came from that era. And, I, you know, there's something in the water is something you hear a lot. I feel like there's something in the water for those Italian Jews, Irishmen, immigrants, kids and grandkids of immigrants in that New York at your era. Well, you know, that's a really good point. And I, I, I think, um, you know, I think, yes, there was something in the water. And I think the water in that point was going going through the experience of your parents coming through Ellis Island, settling in lower Manhattan often without anything to speak of financially, uh, you know, working uh, any number of jobs to just, you know, to just maintain, you know, a sense of, of keeping uh, family together and supporting each other. And, and so I think, you know, the notion of o overcoming that form of adversity, if you will, or those challenges, I wouldn't say adversity, but challenges, I think we've really done done beautifully by our families. And uh, so I think in my family, you know, given the fact I lost my, my dad when I was only 15 years old, he was 44. And and so I think that that puts some, you know, emphasis in my mind. Like another, another connection point for yeah. us, I didn't realize my father, at the same ages on both his father and himself lost his dad at 15 when my grandfather was 44. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's Why? amazing. Well, wow. Why? Why? that's a real connection. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my mother, my mother went into his business without any background that he had started in his early forties and uh, she ran it beautifully and eventually sold it. And so I think, you know, the notion of pushing through challenges, looking for challenges, looking for, opportunities to um, to enhance, to make the world a better place, if you will. Um, my mother was a woman of principle. I think that became very important to me at an early age. And expression my mother often uses is that you do the right things for the right reasons and you live with the consequences. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, I think that stayed with me for many years. And 
and drives a lot of the, the cultural aspects of what we talk about in the book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there because I think when people ask me why I have this honey empire thing, blah, 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 and I literally say, my mom. My mom, you know, first of all, I share her DNA. So being nice and kind, and by the way, I'm uncomfortably competitive, which actually confuses people. Actually, this is a good question, Arthur, since you're, you know, m m many years and success ahead of me on this journey, but I'm very curious, Did you know, and maybe it's the climate we live in today, because obviously, you know, there, it's always a timing thing, but do you feel that people actually confuse individuals that are competitive and don't realize that it's actually very easy to coexist with kindness and competitiveness, but that sometimes competitiveness, especially in the heat of the moment, manifests to something that seems a little bit more aggressive and not naturally kind, and that confuses some outside observers? Yeah, I think it can, but you know, you people um, that I have great respect for, um, even making, um, being as firm as they want to be, making the points they need to make and strong as they need to make it, have always found a way to do it with uh, with a degree of, of kindness. And I go back to Dr. King, two of his closest disciples uh, are close friends of mine. One just passed away, John Lewis, yes. who was a, you know, a very close friend, and Andy Young, who still lives in Atlanta, mm -hmm. two of the closest to Dr. King. And you know, another gentleman who wrote the photo in the book, Jimmy Carter one of the kindest, thoughtful, uh, most caring people I've met in my life, and yet extremely competitive. I mean, there's a story I talk about in the book when we were climbing, climbing rocks together with an outward bound course, and um, his wife got up on top sooner than he did. So I said, you know, Mr. President, this is after he left office, have you had enough? <laughs> I remember looking at me, sweaty, 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 eyes, everything. He said, no. He said, I'm not, we're not leaving until I make this climb. And he did. But, you know, so I, I think you can have both. Well, it's, think, you know, it's funny. I agree. But you know, you know, the way I think about it, and obviously, and you, a, a lot of people don't realize how much success you have in uh, soccer, proper football with your club there too. I do think the physical manifestation versus the boardroom communication style do, does have a little bit of a tweak, right? I see a lot of people, to your point, that I see do a great job in the boardroom managing their people, managing up, down, left, and right. But then you get them in a pickup basketball and they're throwing an elbow in your chest because that's where you get to see the physical yeah. manifestation. Well, of yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that, you know, I, I, I can relate to that. And I would say that's, that's <laughs> probably true. I, I was always very competitive and I still am today. I, mean, I don't like to lose in anything. I remember um, a brief story. I remember my wife and I, uh, when we first, first year we got married, we played Scrabble. We played 24-24. The first one who, uh, who, won 25 games is going to be the champion of Scrabble. And I told this to our, our team, our football team in 2001. They asked me, are you competitive? So we played the last game of Scrabble with no time limits on it. I lost that. We were married 27 years. We never played another game of Scrabble. I love you already. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't like to lose, but, um, you know, anyway, but it's. Um, what, what uh, remind me, is the book out or. It's out. Out. it's out. It's out. It was, uh, it was published September 15th and it's out available and all the oh, book okay. outlets you can imagine. What, what has been the most surprising, you know, for me, I've written five business books and one wine book. I grew up in the wine business uh, of all things. My wow. dad had a liquor store in New Jersey that I transformed to an early dot com wine business. What, the one thing I liked through all six of those process was the feedback. Cause you're in your book for a period of time. The, the feedback that you didn't see coming. I think this would be a fun question that might have some insights. Any, yeah. any feedback from a random email or of somebody close to you of an observation from the book that you had not thought of that you appreciated or that kind of has caught your attention so far here in the couple of weeks that it's been out? Well, I think it's a great question. I don't know, but I'll be seeking the answer. Okay. Because I yeah. really, and I've told people who've read it or you know halfway through it or whatever, I, I'm really interested in uh, in their critique of the book. I mean, you know, as you've experienced when you write one of these books and you go through them, after a while you you fall in love with what you're writing and you you finally sign off on it. it's the best product that you can produce at that time, et cetera, and it tells your story, whatever story it may be. But, you know, how other people see it, uh, and there are a handful of people that I have deep respect for that I'm interested in getting their feedback, and I'm sure they'll give it to me too. So, uh what um do you look at this as 
a legacy piece because you feel like that one of your natural talents, and I, by the way, I'm such a buyer of an important thing you said. I have literally told every CFO, overly financially driven friend of mine, because I tend to, even though I have these big ambitions, obsessed with the process more than actually the dollars that come along with it. I've, I've told them all the time, I believe that kindness actually is a practical financial impactor. And I was, my heart was smiling and my brain was smiling when you said the same. Do you view this as a legacy piece for you because you do think that it is a, yeah. it's a nuance that comes natural to you that you've executed on and your partners at Depot and, and do you feel like this is something that you think is misunderstood is the way I would yeah, I Yeah, I do Gary, but, I, but it's interesting because um, uh, it was just, you know, last year, 2019, probably a lot of the people that you're referring to, or maybe some of the people you're referring to, were part of the business roundtable. So in 2019, after 50 years of being in business, that roundtable, they changed their charter to saying our our emphasis is not just going to be return on, on, on profitability. It's going to be people, planet, and profits all balanced out, c- keeping in mind our associates and our suppliers and our communities as well. So even that group of 192 CEOs, even they've changed their emphasis. And it goes back, you know, Milton Friedman, a great economist, wrote, you know, a book 50 years ago and said the purpose of a corporation is to make money for shareholders, period. That's the end of the discussion. Today, I think, you know, uh, the view is different. It's changing, I think. And uh, that's really the emphasis of the book is that I think you can have both. And I think you need both. One enhances the other. It's not that you have to have one or the other or one takes away from the other. The beauty of a weighted barbell on both ends that is balanced Mm -hmm. is that it's equally weighted. And I think the story in this book is that those good values that based on human relationships between who you're serving, who's doing the serving and the communities you're living in and profitability are all, all equally important. At the end of the day, you want people that work for you, Gary, or people that have worked for me to feel like this is not just about making money. It's about I'm committing, I'm, I'm committing myself to an organization that's making a difference in the world. That's making the difference of other, in other, other people's lives. And your following comes because those people are listening to you because, because they because they believe in what you're sharing with them is making a difference in, in their I'm, lives. I'm and reverse, you have to, share it. to your point, I'm reverse engineering, bringing value on for them, not myself, which I understand the karma of that. It has a practical impact on giving me opportunity for right. myself. It's not super complicated. It's, it's good builds on good. Exactly right. And that's, you know, when you develop that kind of, you know, relationship with who you're serving. So like in our stadium, as an example, we haven't had a couple of good years for a soccer team has been superlative since we've, uh, yep. we've, you know, started the franchise three and a half years ago. Last couple of years, a football team has been, you know, very average compared to the Jets, maybe better, but not a whole <laughs> lot better, but not a whole lot better. By the and way, by the way, great. You know, so, we were, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, you. I know yeah. we were trying to do this a couple of weeks ago, schedules. We, we, when I, you know, I don't want to even bring this up because I know how spicy I get after. I I was watching your football game this Sunday and I said, oh boy, this is, you know, this dude is going to be, yeah. so, you know, because, because that one, that one hurt. Oh, it really hurt. I mean, it's just, you know, when you have that kind of lead, you have to go back. I mean, I, you, your listeners probably don't even want to know this. The Jets may hold a similar record, but you have to go back to 1933 when a team, Scored 39 points, had zero turnovers, and lost the game. So, and on top of that, we had th- the we had the turnover ratio of, of plus three. So, I mean, anyway, I we, we've already moved on. We got to play the Bears next Sunday. Right. Coaches, players, we've all moved on. We got to get ready. On that, real quick, I want to jump in here on this. Very curious. What has there been a challenge transitioning the sports coming from the business world where? It feels to me, and this is almost the most selfish question in podcast history because I'm starting to mentally prepare for hopefully my great dream coming true. You know, it, you know, I'm already thinking through things like in my business life, I feel like I have more control than I do with injuries in football. You gotta give a GM or a coach some breathing room, even when intuitively you're concerned. Has just out of sheer curiosity, how does one find the balance of being able to control things. For example, somebody that has a great interview with you, I don't know how many coaches you've had in your ownership, but you've been through this, I've been through this, and even in my young career, it feels right, right up to the second, and then literally a week later, you're like, uh-oh, 
You know, yeah. I'm sure you've seen that with players, kids you've drafted. Yeah. I've seen it yeah. a million times yeah. over. My brother left my company and started an NFL representation business. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we have uh, we have Foyer, Vayner Sports, oh, really? my company represents yeah. Your player that forced three fumbles, fumbles, three fumbles, three fumbles in yes. one game this last you know, week. Yeah, went coach, to Yale, by the way. Yeah, which went we to very, you're a very smart guy and, and a terrific person and a obviously a great player. Probably, Coach Quinn said it probably the best, maybe the best 17 minutes a linebacker's ever had. We, uh, we, I mean, by the way, uh, even more fun, we also we also represent Keith, De, uh, Beef, uh, the fullback. Uh, and so, and so, yeah. so very we, nice young man. Very nice. So we, you know, um, I watch a lot of your team because of that. You know, tell me what it took to calibrate the inability to act when you wanted to act, which I think is slightly different than running a company where then you have to sometimes wait as well, but not to the same level of degrees, I think, when there's a sports franchise because of so many other variables in it. Well, I, you know, it's really interesting. I think that you know, one one good piece of advice I got from Robert Kraft, who owns the Patriots, is a good friend of mine. And uh, when I when I bought the team in two thousand one, we had breakfast together. I was in New York with Commissioner Tagliabue, going through my owner's orientation, and uh, he said, "Why don't you hang around one day, have breakfast tomorrow with Robert?" And I said, "I'd be happy to do that." So I did. And one of the things Robert said to me was that you're going to hear from a lot of people that the NFL is a different business. You're going to hear that's a different run the NFL, run your franchise, just like you run the Home Depot and you're going to be successful. Now, the one thing that's different, two things are different, one of which you pointed out. When somebody has an injury, God forbid, if Matt Ryan gets hurt, right. you, know, in a different I mean, place. you know, the team's in a different place. Whereas in business, Matt Ryan breaks a leg, he gets a cast on and comes to work the next day, so yeah. you're not losing him. That's right. The, the other thing which is different is that um, the amount of media coverage uh, which is involved with the NFL and therefore all 32 teams is incredible. So when Robert said that to me, I said, well, you know, Home Depot, we took the company public. We're second largest retail in the world today and, you know, et cetera. The so, the analyst he, of Wall Street. he looked at me and he, and he winked like, you know, sometimes you do. I don't know if you have any children, Gary. Yeah, I do. If you have a young child, sometimes they, they won't understand something. So you'll say at some point in your life, you'll understand this. And that's. But, rem but remember, I said it. So. He's turned out to be right. The media coverage on the NFL is incredible. Um, and so, you know, other, other than those two things, it's really, and that's the beauty of the book. It talks about football, soccer, guest ranching, philanthropy, golf retailing, same values apply. You have the same kind of successes available in, in, and in a balanced way. Just for my, my own enjoyment, where do you sit? You know, obviously so much of my career is gonna be built, it looks like, on the foundation of modern communication, right? I was an early investor at Facebook and Twitter and my communications company spends a lot of time on that. In the most ironic of ironic things, I was on a call this morning, for the first time, by the way, in the 11 years that I've run my company with Home Depot because we've just won a significant amount of business with Scott's miracle Grow, and we were having a business meeting, so it's been a Home Depot kind of day. Oh, great. Um, when I. I was just curious, and we were having very progressive conversations around Hulu and and Amazon Prime commercials versus network television commercials. We've already seen the NFL start to dabble with Amazon, right? There's a lot going on there. Just out of general curiosity, you the human, what is your relationship with the social networks and digital? Have you know? Obviously, you know it comes super natural to the six year olds, but it's, yeah. it's very interesting to see like. Do you do you have a LinkedIn account? Do you have a Facebook account? Do you did did any of your you know kids or grandkids get you on TikTok? Like where where is you where are you the man on your media consumptions on your phone and maybe even a little on TV? Are you a Netflix guy? Have you started going into those environments? Yeah, I I, I am. I mean, I enjoy watching a lot of the products produced today on television uh, in terms of Netflix and and um, and uh, Amazon products, etc. Are outstanding. Um, I, I have social media, Instagram, and. Uh, and Facebook, I don't post anything, but I really have them. I told my kids some years ago, um, I have six children. So my youngest are two that are 19, but I told them about six or seven years ago when I went on social media, I told them at dinner time that I was going to do that and just, you know, be able to follow them. So you're smiling. But at the time, my daughter, my twin brother looked across the table and said, Max, his name is Max. Her name is Kylie. She said, do you have any idea what that means? Because, you know, Max was like, he said, okay. She said, that means dad's going to be following us, following all of our posts. We won't be able to say this, that, and the other thing. So 
you know, I have it today because I, I do follow my kids nice. and I'll follow some other close friends. And there, you know, there's you some, follow any of the players on your soccer football team. Just out no, of curiosity. I really don't. But, you know, I follow people like Jay Shetty. I follow Deepak. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, Chopra, they're both very good friends. I, you know, there's some other people. Uh, Simon Sinek, I follow. I mean, there, there are a lot of people that I do follow. I'll follow you in the future. I, I will definitely that. follow you if you, I will, you. Uh, because you're covering the kind of things and have the kind of personality that I would, I would like to learn from. So I, I think, you know, there's opportunities to learn from it. I mean, to me, there's a story I tell in the book, which, you know, you may have picked up, you may not have when we had an opportunity to participate in esports, And, um, you know, it's a situation, I mean, we're a private company, we're not a public company, et cetera. And they came in and our management team had already decided they really wanted to do this. They wanted to participate in it. They came in for their final presentation. The marketing folks came in and they presented it. And one of the slides was a picture of a young man who uh, had made, as I remember, some ungodly amount of money. It was like 500,000 bucks. He was like 12 or 14 years old. <laughs> but they said, they said he practices 10 hours a day, 10, 12 hours a day to be able to be competitive at the level that he's at. So when they left the room, you know, the presenting team and our management team was only there, I said, we're not gonna do this. And, and they said, why, why are we not gonna do it? I said, there's nothing to do with our business, it has to do with our values. I said, I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna encourage young people, honestly, to sit in front of technology 10, 12 hours a day when I think they should be outside and they should be enjoying nature enjoy playing with each other with a lot of structured time or unstructured time, whatever it may be. But I don't think it's to their best interest long term. I, I do think, you know, and you may or may not agree with this, but, you know, I think, Gary, that the level of connectivity that we have today in the United States or throughout the world is at an all time high and is only going to get more so. But the level of neighborhood that exists today in the world is at an all time low. And I think... And I think back to the way you and I were raised in Queens, the environment we were raised in, we were nurtured in a community, uh, both in an apartment. I had four family members living in one tiny apartment. You had eight. You lived in a community where everybody supported each other. Everybody came together, et cetera. We need more of that in this country. Well, and, uh, you know, to, me, to me, I think there's, first of all, from a value filter standpoint, I couldn't agree with you more. I think my take to your point where it skews a little bit different. First of all, the admiration I have for people, I mean, the amount of money I have left on the table because I need to feel good about it is extraordinary. And it is the single, and I'm gonna say this very clearly, it is the single thing that I'm most grateful for. It's just a nice feeling. Right. There's, there's no payday interesting enough for me to feel that feeling. As a matter of fact, it's gonna lead to a different question I wanted to ask you desperately. I, I just wanna get in my mind. What I would say, Arthur, is what I've been able to discover because I've been so deep in the trenches. And I think like anything, there's a great uh, Russian saying, it basically means everything's at its best when it's balanced. So I think yeah. balance is something, yeah. but who defines balance? Parents, society, there's all those variables. Right. I will say that people underestimate the nature of community that is built digitally and the expanding of other views. The counterpoint to that is, especially in political times like this, people start going only into places where they hear affirmation of their points of view. So there's a whole lot here. This is, I think this is a four hour dinner conversation it in is. itself. Yeah. Let me, let me segue Thanks somewhere. Great let, me segue, conversation. let me segue somewhere that I'm very passionate about. I'm enjoying something recently that I think about when I think about good company, which is my inability to be candorous in my youth as a manager and leader because I liked happy and good and honey so much that I would kind of swallow micro little transgressions. Unfortunately though, they would ultimately lead to enough little drops where I would either at my worst shock and surprise someone in, in their firing and then make myself feel better by saying, how didn't they realize they stunk and didn't take right. on accountability. Over the last two to three years, I would say I was on a two out of 10 when it came to candor as a leader, because I overvalued, and it led to, as you can imagine, this is gonna make sense to you, it led to entitlement and a lot of things that I had to work through. I think I'm in 6.5 land right now with an eye towards eight or nine, and I'm excited about that. 
in your journey to get you to a place of these incredible accomplishments and to be able to write a book like Good Company, what part of the formula do you think you had to work on the most and get the reps in versus what came extremely natural to you that rounded out your ability to execute Good Company? Well, I, I would say as it relates to the first point that you were making, you know, uh, I, I, I'm a, a prostate cancer survivor and um, I just got another PSA and was zero. Um, so I'm blessed. But, but, um, but I would say, you know, like cancer, uh, when you see it, you need to deal with it seriously. You need to deal with it early. If not, it spreads. So I think when you're dealing with human behavior uh, within an organization, when you see uh, bad behavior, you need to address it. You need to take it on seriously. It doesn't mean to fire anybody, but it means that you, you, you know, you address it seriously. Yeah. And, yeah, and you know, because if not, it is going to spread, and it's not going to spread just with that person, but it'll spread to other people. So the expression of bad apple, you know, to all me, those, to me, all that's honey, yeah. we've heard. To me, that part of the honey empire was easy. The yeah. part was, I needed to learn a cadence. To your point, where I would cut the cancer every time. It's why yeah. I've had what I've had over these 25 years. Yeah. The process of getting to the cutting was something that I was short on. I didn't do it in a way that I feel great about in hindsight and I'm trying to build towards. Well, Whereas, I think, you know, I think, I think that that usually comes because it means somebody, you know, the whole notion of sink or swimming, you know, in, in business, I don't believe in, you know, there's nothing worse than watching somebody uh, die from drowning. So if you want to put somebody in a sink or swim situation, make sure they're properly trained, make sure they can swim, make sure they can see the shore, make sure you can throw them a lifeguard, if you, if a life jacket rather, if you need to. So, you know, uh, you, you really want to train people, give, put them in the best best place they can be for success and, and try to make sure they have all the tools they, they need for that. You know, if you reach a point, I would say with anybody, that despite all of that, they just don't get it, don't fit in, don't get your values, don't want to leave it. So it's not, you know, really in many, in, in my experience is that you're doing them a favor. It's no fun for you to have to beat them over the head for the next 10 years and tell them they're constantly doing the wrong thing and they don't get it and they don't get it. You know, maybe they just don't fit into your culture. So you do it in a kind way, in a caring way. You let them go. You let them move on to find a different organization that fits more with the way they choose to operate. So when I, when I ask you the biggest growth of people that, you know, because this is, we're, we're getting into very fun territory of me around emotional intelligence and self-awareness and things that really matter. Right. Um, if I just say to you, think of the people that you've seen grow the most through your years from pre depot, let alone depot to today, does it automatically go in your mind? You think of a Carol or a Susie or a Rick or a yeah, John, yeah, you know, yeah. like it's pretty, it's pretty powerful to see that kind of emotional growth. No. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and I, and I would tell you that, you know, um, the, the hallmark to the success of Home Depot, you know, was built on, you know, products, assortment, service level, product knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is to get to 2,200 stores where they are today, it's really built on just one thing, and that's understanding the culture and living the culture. I'll tell you one brief story that when McKinsey was writing a book on the war for talent, um, their partner in Chicago, the senior partner in Chicago, Ray HR partner, came to visit me last after we interviewed 200 of our associates in Canada, in the United States, and in Chile. We we're operating stores there as well. And he said, you know, I've talked to 200 of your associates, a lot of engineers, cashiers, salespeople, store managers, district managers, presidency divisions, merchants, et cetera. And every single one of them talks about the culture exactly the same way. They don't use the same words like it's memorized and just repeating it, but they understand the essence of it and they're living it. He said, I don't know how you do that. I've never met a company anywhere in all of our McKinsey experience that was able, able to do that. And I think that's the essence of what makes us successful at Home Depot and what has made all of our businesses successful today is that the price to get into the game of moving ahead and being a leader, being a manager, is that you have to understand and lead and be an ambassador for the culture of, that, of, of all of our businesses, which we express there in your own culture. So in your case, Gary, you know, it means that, you know, sometimes the people are the best technicians, the best this, the best that. You can hire the best of those things, but you can't always hire somebody and train somebody 
to be the best of the culture that you want to reflect in your organization. Right. Arthur, um, how competitive, um, this is a fun question for me, how competitive were you in seeing how well the book was going to do? Well, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, I, you know, all the, all the, all the proceeds are being donated to the National uh, Civil and Human wow. Rights Museum in Atlanta, which I'm proud of. It's a great place. And good uh, news, Arthur. I definitely didn't think this was a financial exercise no, for you. No, it's but, not. But, but, but winner, I that, winners, winners win. And I know that yes. you didn't need. I'm sure there were some buddies you've had that no. written business books that you wanted to sell I, one more I, copy. I, then I, you know what? I only care about one thing, honestly that the book gets out in the hands of as many people as it can. And primarily, if I had to choose, if you pressed me, and you might, you know, you pressed me, well, which population? I would say the younger population. The Why? people, your, your, your listeners, the people are going to be thinking about how do I live life with a purpose? How do I run a business with a purpose? How do I connect to not just myself and my family and my own circle of love, but to the greater need of serving humanity in a broad sense? And you know, I feel strongly that young people today are pressing on those questions more and more. And I think we're blessed by having a younger population that's doing that. So I would encourage, I mean, you that, that's who your listeners are. And uh, and I would, I would encourage them to continue to press that way. And, you know, they pick up the book or trade it amongst themselves, amongst 10 people, so only one is sold, but 10 read it. That's all I care about is do they read it, do they understand it, do they understand they can have that balance in life where they feel like, you know, life is being fulfilling to them and they're getting confused between their work and their play. They, no you know, way. that whole Zen philosophy is that you don't go to work, you go to play every day. And, you know, that's kind of what we, we try to, we try to uh, relate to. You know, uh, I'm going to have Maha who set this up, connect me with some of your book people. I, I think there's some really fun gamification you can do in social that allows people to act on good behavior to win a copy of the book that I think would probably make you very happy because you'd win on two fronts. There'd be good put into the world and another human would consume it. And so I, I, I got a couple of thoughts when you were just talking that I want to yeah. share with you. Please, thank you. That'd be a blessing for me, thank you. Arthur, I, you know, I really, really don't want to go here because even though you mentioned him as a friend, as you can imagine as a New York Jets fan that has watched every single snap since 1982, I have an uncomfortably difficult situation with the New England Patriots. This is something we also share, you know, that what, what can be learned from a moment like that Super Bowl? That must have hurt quite a bit. It did. You know, um, first of all, it's a, you know, it's a, so, certainly a good question. Um, you know, when you're leading 28 to three in the middle of the third quarter, you, you, you almost think there's almost no way to lose the game. Um, I mean, I really wasn't Are thinking you the that. kind of person? Yeah, that's right. You know, to me, I'm such a no. cynical Jets fan. No, I am too. If you're 49, three no. with two yeah. minutes left, I'm yeah. still yeah. not yeah. talking yeah. about you. Know? I, I am, I am as I, well. So I, even though it was 28 to three, I wasn't thinking. There was a piece of over. your brain thinking about some excitement, yeah. but you were pretty locked into like, I'm not, I was very, I'm not I was very locked in. And as the game started to trend in the wrong direction, as we got through the third and fourth quarter, it was interesting. My mind went to, you know, I'm a father of six, a grandfather of six is that, you know, how do I, how do I be a source of comfort, uh, wisdom, counsel, uh, support for my family, you know, our players, our coaches, our fans. Um, so it, it went away from myself to how do I how do I help others get get through this horrific time, um, and that's what my focus was. I think it probably wasn't until maybe a year later or so that I I went through the personal you know uh, pain myself because I know as you know you're a football fan, 32 teams. It's very hard to get back to the Super Bowl. It takes a single game elimination in the playoffs. So the ball's not round. A lot of things can happen, and uh, you know. Like when I'm at my most down in business and things of that nature, because of my upbringing and the humble nature and just the deep pain of generational suppression in the Soviet Union, you know, I really do care about something as silly as football. I mean, at least it's your team. This is like my my fandom, and I get into right. a very serious place. I do find, by the way, during COVID, I had a lot of friends. We're still in it, but like in the early kind of like first 12, 16 weeks, I had a lot of friends going through some pretty difficult times, and I. I really tried to deploy perspective to them of like, just be grateful for what you have, not what you've lost. Right. Right. I, I remember saying to one friend who was really struggling, 
hey, you do understand that if COVID started eight weeks earlier, Kobe Bryant would probably be alive for the next 50 years. Let's put this into perspective. I understand you're worried about money. Yeah. I understand you're worried about right. a wedding, which is very right. important, but still, let's really put this in perspective. Do you tend to go into that place? I, I tend not to go to the dark place, Gary. What I, what, I, what I tend to do is go to the place to be very much like you described. I mean, I'm blessed. I have you know, great family. We have, we have great, great businesses. Um, our, our golf business is an example, which is just the counter has taken off. I've never seen comp sales in retail in my 50 years of retail that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just incredible. But, you know, to our own associates with football, soccer, our ranches, which we closed the first time in a hundred years, they've been closed. You know, this is 2020. We'll get through this. It's a period of time. 2021 will be fine. We'll go through a transition early 2021 and there will be fine going on. And, you know, keep in perspective all the things we have blessings over and everybody has blessings over. So I also know that like our foundation, we've probably granted 40, 50 million dollars just dealing with, um, you know, emergency situations due to COVID in terms of food safety and health and things of that nature. We've helped how many nonprofits just get through this period of time because these are great organizations that will do great work in 2021 and beyond that. And uh, so we need to help them get, get through this period of time. So it's, 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 we had a meeting here last night talking about a variety of things with our leadership team. And I said, this is a year you take care of your friends, you take care of your family, you take care of your people that you care about, which for us is all of our guests, all of our fans, you know, all of our customers and take care of your associates. And then you worry about other things in 2021. Um, it's just, you know, that's the attitude we have to have. It's a tremendous um, way to this interview. Arthur, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for your time, Gary. I, I appreciate it. Good. Yeah. God bless. Thank you. Hey, everybody on YouTube. First of all, thank you so much. So humbled for your time. I don't want to watch, but time is the biggest asset. So thank you for watching that video. If, uh, if you got some value out of that, there's uh, plenty more where that came from. Feel free to check it out.